All right, everyone. All right. How are we all? How are we doing? The stream has begun. So, welcome to Unlearning Economics' first reaction stream, I guess. Um, I want to say one of many, but I also want to say one of not too many, because I don't want to rely on this type of content. But I think with this one, uh, I just... It just sort of um, sent... <laughs> sent a lot of left YouTube into a bit of a frenzy and I had people linking it to me on like any forum they possibly could Twitter discord reddit lots of people talking about this video so I was just uh, I was just kind of curious to see what it was like um ng spy hello Sophia hello I've got some uh, good uh, some mod presence so you'd all better fucking behave yourselves all right I don't want anyone saying anything remotely good about capitalism. Then that's an instant ban. It's an instant ban, right? So just make sure you uh, make sure you're just solely negative. I only want to see like the worst possible interpretations of Sabine's video, like just straw manning. Um, I want to see like really bad, some really bad faith takes in the chat. Uh, just just uh, no balance whatsoever. That's what we that's what we look for on this on this channel. Still no waiting page. Uh, VAT included. Uh, no, because I am a technophobe and I don't know what I'm doing. So, you know, uh, that's why capitalism is bad, because I don't know how to design a waiting page. That's my full full argument. Um, yeah, Tortik, I agree with you. I feel like I should integrate my Baldur's Gate 3 streams with the capitalism is bad streams. So yeah, I mean, some background. I haven't, I haven't watched this. Obviously, isn't that supposed to be the point of a fucking uh, react video? You haven't, you haven't watched it. Uh, I guess you might have, you might have watched it. But um, Jesus Christ, it's sixteen minutes long. Is that it? Okay, right. So I don't want to. I kind of. Um, <laughs> obviously, concision and brief explainers are good but i do feel like something like capitalism is good like the amount of argument you're able to get into 16 minutes even if you're only even if you're speaking quite quickly even if you are quite concise i just feel like you can't do that 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 topic justice i mean i don't know would i i watch sabine hossen hossenfelder by the way right like i i quite like her stuff on physics i'm um, it's come to my attention since this video that because i searched like i was searching things like sabine hossenfelder debunked or whatever to see what people were saying about this video but it's come to my attention that there's maybe some not great stuff about trans people in there as well so Depending on how this video goes, my opinion of her might be altered. But I will say, you know, she's obviously a physicist. She knows her stuff. I've watched some physics videos uh, from her. And I just can't believe that she would, she, she would like, even something like string theory. Like, string theory is good. Let me explain uh, 16 minutes. Like, is that long enough? And string theory is a subset of physics, right? Uh, capitalism is, you know... Not all of economics, but it is the primary object of study within economics. There's so much you can say about capitalism, right? So, um, her autism video was shit as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, people go outside of their areas of expertise. It's, it's really common. It's, it's common on YouTube. It's not just YouTube. You see it in all sorts of media. Partly, I think, they're encouraged to by audiences, by audience demands. They're encouraged to by, you know, interviewers. I've been interviewed before and you get asked a whole bunch of questions, even within economics where, you know, you don't necessarily know about that area. And I don't know is not an acceptable answer. You're pushed for an answer, right? So there are lots of dynamics that lead to this type of thing. So she's spoken about autism. She's spoken about trans people um, on top of her usual science stuff. So what, 394,000 views, is that like a good view count for her? She's got a million subscribers, so her engagement's like below, it's clearly below her, look, is, trans, is being trans a social fad among teenagers, 500, so her, her average engagement is below her subscribers, but that's not necessarily a sign that her channel's like dead, I think she just has quite a high upload frequency. Alright, but yeah, anyway, anyway. 
it was very bad it was very bad okay it was very bad all right here we go so are we gonna let's <laughs> let's uh let's go bloody hell is this gonna be exhausting am i gonna <laughs> am i gonna start crying is that what's gonna happen here i feel like i'm gonna start crying at some point okay Listen, will kill us all that is if you trust greater Thunberg, which maybe you should not free markets will save us all if you trust robert f kennedy jr which maybe you should not maybe we should talk about what capitalism and free markets are will they kill us or save us that's what we'll talk about today okay so i am going to allow her to elaborate on her argument but i don't know okay no actually you know what you know what for my my fair my fairness uh alarm is is tingling i need to let her say a bit more before i say anything okay <laughs> before we talk about capitalism and markets and stuff we need to talk about money i don't mean my money though while we're at it check out my patreon i mean money in general what do we even need money for suppose you have an apple but you'd rather have an egg you ask your friend sue the one with the chickens and trade an egg for an apple okay but what if Sue doesn't want an apple? She'd rather have a banana. No problem. You ask your friend Joe with the bananas if he will trade your apple for a banana. Then you trade the banana for Sue's egg. Okay, but what if Joe doesn't want an apple either? He'd rather have new shoelaces. No problem. You ask your friend Mary if Help. she'll take an apple for shoelaces. Help me. <laughs> give the shoelaces to Joe, take the banana, give the banana to Sue, and sure enough, you have your egg. It works, but honestly, that seems a little cumbersome. It does seem a little cumbersome, which is why it is a completely inaccurate history of how money emerged. That doesn't make any sense. You don't have like you, you can't just go back in time and be like well hey uh what was life like before money before markets and before capitalism uh maybe it was just basically the same as we have now but without money then people must have invented money because our system right now wouldn't make sense without money so obviously people came up with it you can't keep the <laughs> the structure of the economy exactly the same uh and just take money out of it because it didn't make any sense like this is i don't know where she's gone has she gone to like uh, an economics textbook from like 20 years ago because david graeber in particular as many of you will know right ha has sort of devoted <laughs> the latter part of his career to disproving this idea people didn't have like apple uh you know orchards they didn't have um they didn't have, uh, you know, poultry farms. They didn't have uh, shoe factories before modern capitalism, before money, because you can't have those things without the system of money. How do you, you know, where do you get all the raw materials from to produce shoes en masse? You know what I mean? Before you produce them, right? So you, you're a shoe, imagine you're a shoemaker in this weird barter economy. You, you have to get the inputs the building the land in order to make your your mass produced shoes or maybe it's not even mass produced let's it's a sort of artisanal shoe shop but you're making plenty right in this story that's what she seems to be depicting right you where do you get your inputs you haven't made any shoes yet so you can't barter them you need you need money you need credit right and that is exactly before we had modern uh, modern money and modern capitalism there was there were there were kind of pseudo credit relations now what this meant in practice was not like a modern credit system but more like you know you owe me one right it was like that was kind of it was informal it was social you know uh you know oh you did me a favor at one point um you uh you know you fixed you fixed my shoes because you're good at that then i owe you one and one could be you know anything it could it might not even be like giving them an apple it might be something much more patriarchal like you know you can marry my daughter in exchange for it you know what i mean this was this was the the problem is that what you've got here is a very pure economy of just barter of just goods and maybe services um without any of the social relations and this is what a lot of people miss about the history of capitalism like how it changed social relations because we had the relationship of debt 
which was always moral, which always revolved around communities and what they owed each other and how they governed themselves, right? Um, and, and that was inherently social, whereas this is a pure... This is like the kind of thing that economists stopped believing quite a while ago like like i mean not quite a while ago but like i think since the release of david graeber's debt the first five thousand years like if you ask it might still be in some of the textbooks but if you ask a lot of economists they'll say oh no we know that that the sort of myth of barter it's called right we know that's a myth and the modern textbooks are updated um anyway One minute and 23. Uh, we are like 7% of the way through. Let's go. How about we instead trade something that everyone would accept because they can exchange it for something else later, like gold maybe. I give some gold to Sue and she gives me an egg. Then she can take the gold and give it to Joe and get her a banana. That's much easier. Hooray, we just invented commodity money. So just to press on this point a little bit, uh, the invention, uh, the, the use of currencies like gold was not always, I think that, uh, you know, all of history is a big place, right? I'm not a historian. I'm willing to concede there are exceptions, right? But generally speaking, if you're going to impose a monetary standard, you need to be a state and states would have the power to say, um, firstly, you know, this is what we accept in taxes and you have to pay taxes. Uh, states and also state-like entities like local landlords maybe as well might have levied taxes, which would mean that people would want to get this this particular commodity, whether that was gold, silver or modern fiat currency. Um, also tender laws, right? You know, you may have heard the expression legal tender. Uh, people randomly use it sometimes in, in strange situations. Uh, but legal tender is just like, you know, that actually counts as money. So it is generally the case that it's not like these two uh, stock image cartoon people happily inventing money it was again intertwined with violence with states with politics and so on all right but now imagine you don't want to buy an egg sorry orion is correct in my chat i i said states not modern states he said he said he or they said kings rather than states back then you're absolutely right kings um sometimes queens uh, any type of authority essentially egg, but an entire chicken farm that would be a lot of gold you'd have to wheel around. So how about we instead, I don't know, print the face of a king onto a piece of gold and say it stands for an entire cart of gold? Come to think of it, why bother with gold? Let's just print it on a piece of paper. The paper itself doesn't have much of a value, but if we all agree on what it stands for, we can use it for trade. Hooray, we just invented token money. That sounds great, but the problem is, if a lot of vendors just refuse to accept the money, it stops working. So in reality, token money is backed up by a king or a government. Okay, fair play, fair play to her. She can't. She did touch on this point in a, but in a slightly different way. Recall that what I said was that the the king or the government would come in and impose this, right? And that's how money emerged. What she's saying, right, is that money emerged but they didn't have a good way to make sure it was used. Therefore, they used the king. Those are two very different uh, stories, you know, temporally. Uh, they, they're, they're completely reversed. Which enforces that vendors accept the money as payment. It's then called fiat money. Almost all money we use today is fiat money, except cryptocurrencies, but that's another story. Fiat money is fascinating because it's ultimately still based on trust. If all you guys watching this video freak out, exchange your entire US dollars for euro and tell your friends to do the same, the US dollar would collapse. So don't do it. Several economists have argued that any community of sufficiently intelligent traders will eventually introduce a type of... So... I don't really know what she means by that, right? Like, I mean, ultimately, every currency does depend on trust, and there is a chance that it can collapse, right? That is true, but the US dollar is a really strange example for her to use because it is literally the world's reserve currency. Like, it's really widely used by financial institutions and governments. And so I know she's kind of communicating a point here, saying if you and your friends do this, she doesn't literally mean that, but like... 
collapsing the US dollar is something that would take more than investor panic like and in, and there's there's so much underlying treasuries i mean adam twos had this really interesting post in his chart book which everyone should read by the way about the us treasury market and how fundamental it became um to to the global financial system right so it's just it's a bit it's okay i'm not saying that everything she said there was completely wrong but it was just a bit of an odd example like i would have I would have used a different currency. I don't know. US, US dollar is very, very stable. It's the exorbitant privilege it's been called of the USA. Token money because it's the most efficient way to distribute resources. This idea was maybe first clearly formulated by the Scottish economist Adam Smith. All right, so we have money, but our busy traders still have a problem. Suppose you have a lot of apples and not sufficiently many people to buy them. Your amazing apples rot away. What a shame. You would like to make apple juice from them, but you can't afford a juice press, so your breakthrough innovation doesn't come into being. That sucks. Again, you have all these apples, but you can't afford a juice press. Is she not touching on the problem I, I mentioned at the start? Like, how did you afford the stuff to make those apples in the first place when there was a system of barter? You can't. However, your friend Sue has been getting really rich with all her chickens. So rich, in fact, she's sitting on a big pile of money that she doesn't know what to do with. Sue sees your problem and offers you a deal. She gives you some of her money so that you can buy your juice press. You just have to agree that if you get rich with your juice press, you give her the money back plus something on top. That money which Sue gives to you is your capital. And such was born the capitalist. The capitalist is a personal institution who provides capital to those who want to launch a new business. Someone who's able and willing to take the risk that this capital will never have a return on investment. Today we grow up with money. <laughs> She's just making stuff up. This didn't happen. What well, like capitalism just emerged because one had so wait a second wait a second so so wait a second <laughs> right i'm gonna have a fucking aneurysm capitalism so we we've already got capitalism in our example okay we've got capitalism because you've got an apple an orchard uh someone who specializes in producing apples and then you've got someone who specializes in producing in in poultry right you've got a poultry farm right so you've got that specialization so we already have ca have capitalism right but then they're unable to sell their products they're unable to sell apple juice they want to sell apple juice but they can't afford the juicer where like we we how can we say capitalism emerged from this situation when that is already capitalism and furthermore <laughs> Does she think that people that loans started, like business business loans, lend, the lending of financial capital? Lots of confusion over this word capital, by the way. Financial capital. Does she think that that happened um, because some capitalists got rich and then lent to others? Like I'm not saying that's never happened in history, but this is we're talking about the emergence of capitalism, right? So. Capitalism emerged because we already had capitalism and some capitalists got rich and lent money to others. But that was the real start of capitalism. Right. Here's what actually happened. Uh, double entry bookkeeping uh, emerged possibly in the Arabic empires uh, during the even maybe during even during the first millennium, but maybe um, maybe, at the, uh, you know, after the turn of the millennium um, and then later in um, Renaissance Italy. Right. Double entry bookkeeping emerged that allowed uh, a financial institution to create credit basically out of nothing right now not out of nothing again it comes back to this issue of trust which to be fair she has touched on trust is important right do you trust the bank um do you you know do they trust the lender is there something solid is there a solid business idea underpinning this do they have the reserves the capital to you know um cope in, in the case of an emergency in the case that some of their investments don't pay off but this that's what began to emerge that's where credit came from right but then at the same time you know the history is so flattened not to mention wrong here because we, we, <laughs> because like 
that happened before what we would recognize as capitalism emerged, right? You're talking about the Arabic empires. You're talking about Renaissance Italy, 14th, 15th century. Like, and, and most people tend to think of capitalism as emerging a bit later. Now, of course, there's a lot of debate over this, but I wouldn't say you're going to learn anything about that historical debate, which is, which is super interesting. I've been looking into it recently. You know, there's the Brenner debates, how, mar how marketized, how, you know, capitalist were was medieval england for example all those types of questions um as to barter i didn't make any historical claims i really use that as a motive I, I merely use that as a motivation for why money is useful i frankly think people try to deliberately misunderstand it but why would you use a story that is completely untrue. Do you not think that you would understand more about how money is useful if you use the correct story historically? You know, why would I, what about if I said, oh, you know, well, my, my theory of atoms, you know, in my theory of atoms, like, they're all, uh, they all actually follow the uh, pudding model, you know, the current model where it's like a positive charge with loads of bits of negative charge. And I, I only use that to show why atoms are useful. You know uh, why? Why we need them? Why they? Why they create? Why they create uh, matter? I, I I just use that. I didn't ex expect people to take it literally. Like uh, I don't know. I don't understand the insistence on starting economics with things that are known to be one hundred percent wrong. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's. I know, I know. You were just quoting that, Adam. I know. I, I wasn't uh, having a go. Tom, you reckon she's not that good at physics? Oh, man, you know, I try to, I try to enjoy things. <laughs> I'm an average. I'm an average thing enjoyer. You know, I am literally an average thing enjoyer. I just like to enjoy things, but I can't. Because everything is shit. Right, let's go. And banks and all that, and we tend to take them for granted. And while money lending and a basic notion of financial debt date back thousands of years, capitalism and all the elaborate financial instruments that come with it is a surprisingly recent innovation. It didn't really take off until the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago, and it's dramatically changed the world. You cannot explain the emergence of capitalism very well with her framework because essentially what you're saying is that capitalism, there were always drives, underlying drives towards capitalism. You know, people had to invent money, people had to invent trade, but when one person got rich and another one uh, wasn't rich, they, uh, they had to start to lend to each other. That is apparently something that is kind of a fundamental drive of humanity, the natural propensity to truck bartering trade is what Adam Smith called it. And yet, for 250,000 years, we didn't do it in, in the way we do it now. So what changed? I mean, let's give her a chance to answer. Let, maybe she's going to say what changed. Scientists tend to associate the stunning societal progress we've seen since then to science and technology. But I think that's having it backwards. The driver of all this progress was the capitalist system that allowed an efficient allocation of resources. By resources, I don't just mean raw materials, but also goods and human resources. Capitalism is a system that distributes these resources without anyone needing to have an overview, just by interactions between traders. It's pure genius if you think about it. And that's why science took off, not the other way around. Remember that story about how the Scottish physician Alexander Fleming supposedly accidentally discovered penicillin in 1928 and saved the lives of countless wounded soldiers in World War II? Yeah, well, that isn't really what happened. First of all, scientists had discovered that the fungus penicillin inhibits the growth of bacteria decades earlier. It just wasn't widely known. The British psychologist Burden Sanderson, for example, observed this in 1870 and wrote a book about it. There are also several other written documentations from other people around that time who had studied the effects of fungi on bacteria. Fleming's contribution was that he realized the fungus was shedding a particular substance which he called penicillin, but he pretty much left it at naming the stuff. 
It wasn't until 10 years later that a group at the University of Oxford set out to find a way to grow the fungus and extract penicillin in large quantities. They then conducted medical trials, and once they were sure penicillin was both safe and effective, their method was scaled up by the pharmaceutical industry. Two members of the Oxford group later shared the Nobel Prize with Fleming. So what saved all those many lives wasn't just Fleming's observation in a petri dish. The game changer was producing the stuff in large quantities and bringing it where it was needed. Innovation and industrialization ultimately going back to capitalism. That's what saved all those people. Capitalism got a pretty bad rep when Marx claimed... Okay, before she talks about Marx... <laughs> So, wait, I don't think this conclusion follows from her example, right? Because she says, look, scientific discovery is often uncertain, potted, you know, attributing it to one person, Fleming, whoever, uh, it is usually a mugs game, right? You've got, you've got to appreciate that there are usually teams of researchers and long lapses of time between different inventions. But what she said is that a team at the University of Oxford picked it up. Now, I don't understand what that has to do directly with capitalism, right? You might make an indirect argument about, about capitalism and, and how it enabled the University of Oxford to exist, even though it predates capitalism, actually. But but they, they're the ones that picked it up, right, and developed it. And then she says they developed it into a form where it could be taken and spread by, by, um, by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. The the uh, the polio vaccine, for instance, um, was was much more socialized, right? It wasn't it wasn't it wasn't picked up as much by pharmaceutical companies. It wasn't like patented or anything. Uh, and you can just have government efforts. Governments can mobilize the funds through taxation, through the financing financing of uh, government spending. There there are lots of different ways to scale up distribution uh, and in her story so she she said before she's like capitalism leads to progress but in her story it seemed like the scientific community and universities invented this and then the private sector kind of came in later uh and you know that that's just not that's not the same story again temporally we get what's it this thing about time that she has does she keep she keeps getting things in the wrong order and by the way you know, you guys that follow me, you know I'm not, I'm willing to acknowledge, you know, the private sector has, has some uses or has had some uses. I think talking about Marx, obviously, you know, Marx and Engels weren't just uh, capitalism bad people, were they? So, you know, the private sector can, it can uh, provide the resources to, and mobilization to put things, put things out there. But the, the original invention in this case and in the case is the case with the covid vaccine as well it was oxford university again and they weren't going to patent it and then bill gates came along and said no you've got to patent it um and we've got to use the pharmaceutical industry they didn't want to you know maybe there are other ways of of bringing these things out once the scientists have invented them and we know now that a lot of vaccinations are completely unequally distributed we know that there are places there are uh, factories in the rich and the poor world in Bangladesh and Canada that are saying we can't produce this vaccine because of patents, which is a property right, which is capitalism. And by the way, she hasn't talked about fucking property rights. She hasn't even talked about capital. What's capital? What is capitalism? Is she? Is that where she's going to get to? Maybe she's going to. Maybe she's going there. Yeah, I don't claimed that it's just about grabbing hold of the means of production and exploiting the working class. Of course, there was an element of truth to his fears because some things went badly wrong during the Industrial Revolution, but that's another story. For today, we just need to know that... Ca Wait, what? <laughs> what? The ma your main man, the main critic of capitalism, the, the fucking... The guy the guy he's another story <laughs> in a is she gonna come back to him what that's another story <laughs> yes yes the industrial revolution created misery for workers and you know there are these this whole set of uh, this whole set of structural dynamics of the economy and uh, you know how profit evolves and how 
how labor is exploited and how capitalism tends to perpetual crisis and ultimately creates the seeds of its own destruction. But that's another story. Let's just focus on why capitalism is good. <laughs> Okay, I'm waiting for her next video, everyone. I'm waiting for her next video. Karl Marx, Karl Marx was good, let me explain. Now, if she, if she does that, if she does that, then, you know, we can say it's a series. It's okay, it's a series. Oh, Sabine, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I'm gonna die. Okay, all right, all right, I'm not gonna die, I'm fine. Capitalism, like fiat money, requires a governing institution. That's because someone must be there to enforce contracts should the need arise. That and a few other things, as we'll see in a moment. That a few other things? <laughs> Why did she just say contracts? I don't know. Am I being mean there? Now, maybe I'm just being mean. But, like, it, con enforce contracts and a few other things. What's the uh, the swan meme? You know, what what are the other things? Uh, and the swan, like, yelling at someone and then running away. What are the other things? Right? <laughs> that's what came into my mind. But that's another story. This is her new phrase. This is her new saying. Her channel's new saying. But that's another story. There are many different ways to govern a capitalist system. And they go by different names, like welfare capitalism or laissez-faire capitalism or state capitalism now one can debate how well the actions of certain governments reflect the interests of their electorate if they were elected in the first place but that's another story even so <laughs> that's another story everyone that's another story how this is <laughs> you know like all the stuff that's like up in up in up for debate at the moment about capitalism you know that's another story <laughs> oh god right i need some ice on my forehead Capitalism has There's been enormously successful in unlocking societal progress and the nations who still don't oh. use it, such as Sorry. North Korea, Cuba and Laos, are places you don't want to live. Okay, so, Lao. Lao's a new one. I like that. I like that. I like, I like the, I like Lao. I like Lao being put in there. I don't, look, I don't know anything about Lao. <laughs> but like, uh... North Korea, North Korea and Cuba, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll concede, look, you know, it's a great point, I don't want to live in an authoritarian <laughs> dictatorship uh, like North Korea or Cuba, um, which it has to be said is, is not quite the same as North Korea, uh, but like, do, do you think that maybe there might be some other options? You know when you put all the different types of capitalism, um, all the different types of capitalism next to each other. You know you could have expanded that list. You could have put like radical social democratic capitalism as well. Uh, you could have put like market socialism. Uh, that you know you could have put like anarchism and um, you know c communism is very loaded, right? But like there's different types of communism and people who talk about uh, you know uh, communities and. Uh, workers associations kind of running things and coordinating politically that is what we need to discuss that is the conversation that most people who have an interest in and a passion for this subject are having like that that's that's just what we need to talk about so why talk about North Korea? Like, who wants... To, I mean, okay, I know on the internet, unfortunately, we have, like, people who <laughs> who think they want to live in North Korea. But those are, like, children with Twitter. Serious people don't want to. Um, and also, there are loads of, like... There are historically loads of capitalist dictatorships. I mean, you know, Chile, uh, for example, and, and Brazil. But, like... Even now, China's kind of, you know, China's kind of on the fence. I mean, it's got a communist, it's kind of, to be glib, you could say it's communist politically, right? But it's capitalist economically, uh, but it's kind of state capitalist. But that's a capitalist country, you know, do you want to live in China? You know, well, if you like capitalism, you obviously want to live in China. You obviously want to be, an, we are Muslim in, uh, in a concentration camp if you want, if you like capitalism. So, you know. 
why would you muddy the waters with this association with authoritarianism, totalitarianism, dictatorship? Russia's capitalist, yeah. You like capitalism? Oh, so you like invading the Ukraine? We've seen that capitalism is a system that combines markets with governing rules to efficiently distribute resources. This distribution of resources... Okay, so I just want to intervene again because I don't think she's proved the idea that capitalism distributes resources efficiently. She used the one penicillin example, which I'm not sure really made sense, but even if it did, even if, let's say penicillin was like a triumph of capitalism, um, even though it was invented like very early capitalism, but like, let's say that was, that was a triumph of capitalism, right? That, does it follow? Does, does it follow that capitalism allocates resources efficiently? No. Like, what about all the times when it doesn't? What about, um, what about the uh, sh crisis in global shipping during the pandemic? You know, when shipping companies, uh, they'd increased the size of their uh, ocean liners to be too big to fit in some ports. And they were also taking empty ocean liners from uh, Los Angeles to China rather than st stocking them up with the goods that Chinese people might need uh, because that was more profitable. So you have empty ocean liners Ocean liners queuing for fucking ages at ports, uh, not getting anything done. The sailors weren't allowed to leave the, the boats for like days and weeks even at a time. So that was an inefficient allocation of resources. Like it's pretty simple to think of examples either way, right? You've got to make a general argument, uh, make some kind of statistical claim. I mean, you know, maybe she, maybe she should read this because <laughs> even, I mean, Sol, you know, he makes an attempt. He, I mean, he does. He does argue for why capitalism is efficient, right? But I just this comes down to the sixteen-minute mark, right? I don't. I don't think she's she's done it. But she hasn't even really attempted to do it. So remains to be proven. This works best if everyone can put forward their offers freely and customers can pick what they want. This is known as a free market, and it optimizes the distribution of resources by. Comp Jeez, man, I'm getting fucking whiplash from that. Okay, so this is where we all uh, take a moment to praise our Lord and Savior, Hajun Chang, who freed my mind from the grip of this type of thinking. Because that, on the screen right in front of you, this, right, is an oxymoron, right? Because free markets are the idea that you have a deregulated market. Uh, and that you people are basically not bound by various rules um and so you just it just shows you that a free market essentially i mean i remember chang saying this it's like in the eye of the beholder people see free markets where they want to say capitalism is good so they'll say if something good happens they'll be like well that's the operation of the free market but when something bad happens they're like oh that's government regulation and it's like well government regulations right like they almost always exist um, so if you want to, you can always attempt to attribute anything bad that happens under capitalism um, to to them. And <laughs> apart from anything else, this isn't a good definition of capitalism. She hasn't spoken about ownership of capital. What's going on? Who owns the means of production? She mentioned them briefly when she talked about Marx, but that that but that's another story. You see. So we're not going to talk about the means of production. Something about contracts, but we didn't stay on that for too long. Contracts, also very important, the employment contract. That's one, David Ellerman argues that the employment contract is actually the defining feature of capitalism in what I think is quite a, a cool little uh, book he has. Uh, you know, establishing types of ownership of private property over factories, um, over land, uh, that is the emergence of capital and i would say for me i would say capitalism equals capital as in the the private ownership of the means of production um of uh you know land as well and you could add maybe more modern things like intellectual property of ideas and things private ownership plus markets that would be my definition of capitalism capital plus plus markets i think if you try and abolish capital somehow through um you know 
democratic forms of ownership through really aggressive redistribution, um, through state ownership as well. Uh, but you keep markets, then you've got market socialism. Um, and capital, I don't know what capital without markets would look like. Um, I guess we're kind of going there. When Elon Musk owns everything, that'll be capital without markets. So that's uh, economic dictatorship. Yeah, capitalism minus free markets equals rules. No, that's actually true, Joseph. That's a really good point. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah, if you t if you subtract uh, free markets from both sides of this equation, then capitalism minus free markets equals rules. So that's true. That's yeah. Petition. Nice one. <laughs> free markets are a beautiful example of decentralized self-organization, an invisible hand, as Adam Smith put it. The way it works in a nutshell is that everyone can trade around until they've got what they think is the best combination of goods, services and financial assets. What if I am a young uh, six year old girl from the Philippines who has no family and no property and the thing that I can get by trading um is money and what i'm trading is sexual favors for a rich uh businessman it's just it's it's such a simple fucking counter example you know what i mean if someone doesn't use resources as efficiently as possible some competitor can do it better and beat them off the market sorry the rich businessman's friends uh, are actually going to offer me three cents instead of two for the sexual favors that you know this is great it's great the free market working in action this idea also goes back to adam smith but later blossomed into an entire discipline now known as microeconomics microeconomics is all about how agents that could be people i, I mean I, d I don't want to be nitpicky here but microeconomics isn't a discipline right it's a sub-discipline and also the invisible hand of the market is kind of present in some versions of macroeconomics as well so i just i you know, I don't want to nitpick, but I just, I don't think she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> or corporations or institutions trade and how that trade distributes resources where they are most needed. To be fair, microeconomics has some shortcomings when it comes to explaining how we trade in reality, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> why does she keep saying that does she say that in her other videos does she say that in her other videos because i feel like i'm gonna notice it now Why don't more people question it when a system allegedly based on rationality and numbers suddenly needs you to believe in invisible hands? It's a fair point. It's a fair point. Ah, what? So that just completely undermines everything she said at the beginning. <sighs> I, I'm glad this video is short. I might... I, I, if it were twice the length, in fact, if it were even, if it were even one minute longer, then I would, uh, start bleeding out of my ears. Large microeconomics works fine and several Nobel prizes have been awarded for it. One of the most important insights to come out of this research area is that free markets only work to everyone's benefit. I will, I will read the comment, Adam. I'll, 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 uh, I'll read the comments. If they're set up properly. Keep in mind that capitalism isn't just a free market. It's a free market plus the governing framework to run it. Free markets do not, for example, work to everyone's favor if some people have insider information, which gives them a trading advantage. This is why we have laws against that. Free markets also work badly if one single company dominates the market sector and can use their power to force customers to stick with them. This is why we have laws against that. This is why we don't have free markets. This is why we have regulated markets. That's the point I was getting at earlier. 
And free markets also don't automatically account for externalities, such as environmental pollution. An externality is generally any consequence of trade that doesn't directly affect the trading parties. They can be both good and bad, but it's the bad ones that are the problem. Suppose no, 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 no. Okay, okay, okay. Technical point, right? Positive externalities are a problem. Just because they have the word positive in them, that doesn't mean they're not a problem. Okay. You know, if you've actually read an economics textbook, and I actually think that I might have mentioned this in my free stuff video, a positive externality, right, means that there are benefits to third parties who are not in the transaction. So a pretty classic example would be education, right? Um, I get educated. It benefits me, obviously, but it benefits everyone around me. It benefits society to have a common standard of literacy. Any potential employer who's going to, you know, uh, maybe hire me or whatever, it's going to benefit them. The result is that positive externalities uh, result in under provision. People under invest in them if left to their own devices in a private marketplace. That is the basic logic of the microeconomics textbook. Now, you can dispute the way that's framed, but I think the point is, you know, when there are collective goods, um, when there are things that we need to coordinate with uh, each other about and when we need to make a sustained effort to invest in, uh, they're going to be under provided by a market system. So, she has got positive externalities wrong, wrong there, even though, I mean, at least get it right. If you're just going to recite, she's doing like an Econ 101 textbook from like, you know, before I think 2008 or before the impact of like the 2008 crisis made itself felt on the economics profession when the textbooks were still like, you know, Greg Mankiw type shit. Uh, she, she's, she's doing that, right? Markets work generally, but oh, watch out for monopoly, but oh, watch out for, you know, uh, environmental effects um, and watch out for maybe uh, certain problems with information. She mentioned insider trading. That's a very specific example that applies to financial markets, by the way, but there are more general problems with information. So she's just doing a, an old-ish, a slightly dated Economics 101 textbook, right? But uh, I don't think she's got it right. Also, it's quite funny because I said at the beginning, I, she, she introduced... The, by talking about um, Greta Thunberg, right, and um, Robert F. Kennedy. And, you know, it seems to me that she's just acknowledged that the environment is the mother of all negative externalities. Uh, or maybe she didn't say that, but she did use that as an example, and it is the usual example for negative externalities. Now, does it not follow that capitalism will create devastating climate change and horrible environmental problems and therefore... Greta Thunberg is somehow right? I mean, is she going to engage with Greta Thunberg's arguments? Who knows? Maybe that's another story. Is there's a river going by your house that everyone is free to use. One day a clothing company puts up a factory and dumps their toxic waste into the river. Or the fish die and no one dares swimming in the river anymore. This is clearly not an optimal use of resources, you might say. Why didn't Smith's invisible hand prevent it? The reason market forces didn't prevent it is that the water was free to use. The market didn't know it had any value, so pollution couldn't reduce its value. There are several ways to deal with problems like this. One is to just pass laws that forbid certain actions and punish those who disobey. Or you can put a tax on the pollution so that at least the government has money to clear up the mess. Or you can put a price on using the water. There are pros and cons to all of those, but that's a different story. <laughs> the sto Tell us, tell us what the fuck you're talking about. What's going on? Why do you, every single interesting question that arises as a result of your analysis, you feel the, you just fucking pigeonhole it and go, that's another story. I can't, that's ridiculous. D okay, so <laughs> let's talk about some of these because obviously, look, Banning factories from polluting water is good. Um, putting grates in chimneys that stop the worst type of pollution is good. Carbon tax, I would agree with it. Other forms of pricing, 
maybe you know there there are pros and cons of something like cap and trade um where they trade the permits because sometimes they can kind of uh profit from that like tesla for example had profited for a long time because it doesn't emit any emissions or just well not none obviously much fewer than a, a car that sells um a car company that sells cars that use petrol solely uh they they were able to sell all their credits and um therefore they kind of enabled the other companies to to pollute so there are some problems here there's also this issue of carbon lock-in which i actually have a paper partially about which will come out i don't know at some fucking point uh you know you know the timeline of things in academia but there's issue of carbon lock-in so it's like sometimes when our economies are so dependent on carbon emissions and this is what greta thunberg's kind of getting at right when our economies are really really dependent you know we've got uh cities that revolve around cars our economies maybe rely on industries that have quite a high uh use of of co2 and other greenhouse gases um it's really difficult just to tax carbon and expect people to suddenly change their behavior what you have to do is transform the economy transform the city you know pedestrianize it ban cars like um oslo did you know um you have to uh you know invest in other industries right give people an alternative support the workers who are uh, support the workers who are going to be impacted when you know your 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 com- country's uh flagship industry is is basically eliminated because it produces too much carbon so this issue of carbon lock in like we're so addicted you know for to our carbon uh, intensive lifestyles that we need real transformative change that's the basis of the cause for the green new deal people like greta thunberg that's the basis for being against just these little technocratic measures but i think that requires much more critical thinking about you know our cities about our industries and about what capitalism has produced uh than, than we're going to get here hmm story for today is that we have known that externalities can lead to market failures since the middle of the last century. Carbon dioxide emissions are such an externality. For the market to optimize the use of fossil fuel resources, we should have put a price on releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We did not. And that's why we're now in deep shit. So, yes, our current capitalist systems do have a problem with environmental protection, but the reason isn't that there's something wrong with capitalism per se. It's that we didn't set it up correctly in the first place. Suppose I used this argument to defend North Korea, and I said that the issue with communism or socialism isn't communism or uh, socialism per se. It's that they set it up incorrectly now in a way i do i do believe a version of that argument but i think most people find it kind of unsatisfying right and i don't think that she'd accept that argument also i think it's it's kind of it's kind of weird to me that you would have a need to say this isn't a problem with capitalism when you've just outlined the the capitalist logic that leads to this problem there is a clear logic of capitalism of markets of negative externalities that leads to this problem so you can say it's a problem of capitalism but it's like it's solvable um but you know i don't agree for the reasons i outlined about like carbon carbon lock-in earlier basically the origin of the problem is that no one paid attention to economists and unfortunately we still don't pay enough attention to economists The current situation is that companies who voluntarily produce environmentally friendly goods put themselves at a competitive disadvantage because other companies exploit the environment at zero cost. This moves the burden onto the consumer. If you want to buy a climate friendly product today, you face extra costs because fossil fuels are cheap and getting to net zero is not. This makes no economic sense, and it'll ultimately not work. It's completely upside down. Products whose production causes damage to the environment, which then requires adaption and mitigation, should be more expensive, not less expensive.
This is why economists have argued for decades that we need to put a price on carbon. And it's why several countries have now introduced carbon taxes or use a cap and trade system. To calculate the cost of carbon emissions, one basically needs to evaluate the damage the emissions would cause in the future and then put a price on them. It's called the social cost of carbon. There's a long debate about just exactly how to calculate this, but that's, but that's another, another story. story. Hey, oh, so look, um, I, I kind of outlined some of my issues I have with the carbon tax. I'm, I, I, I'm going to avoid the we don't listen to economists enough now. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it at the end, uh, but I, I just I just don't understand why she wouldn't engage with the literature on social on the social cost of carbon which is really fucking hard to estimate by the way like how do you how do you estimate the cost of a, a catastrophic climate change right at, at a basic level there are loads of problems there's loads of different methods to try and do this i mean i've honestly i've taught plenty of courses about this and i always find it hard to justify because i don't think when you're trying to estimate something like the financial cost of carbon you're trying to translate things which are basically incommensurable so like you know uh bangladesh flooding let's say all of bangladesh floods right like what rise in gdp do we want to compensate for that well the answer is that we don't want it to happen and virtually nothing or no nothing can compensate for that right and that's the fundamental problem you run into with the social cost of carbon and when you look at the measures the ways the methods that economists estimate this stuff it's like it's really fucking weird it's like it's like people who uh go to a, a slightly riskier job a job with a higher risk of death like someone who works on uh roofs who works at height and there's a risk of them falling down you know versus someone who works closer to the floor like that's treated as the the cost uh and and so sorry back up the person who works on the roof gets paid more than the person who works you know down safely on the ground and the differential is treated as if they've calculated their probability of death now you and i all know that there that that's there are behavioral reasons that people don't understand their probability of death there are structural reasons that force people to work in more dangerous jobs that have more to do with their situation than their personal preferences and beyond that even if you believe the kind of uh, basic framework how could you generalize from that to like catastrophic climate change? It's a completely different, you know, uh, type of risk at much lower level that's, you know, somewhat voluntarily incurred. It's just it's just not the same. So anyway, when sorry, when she says that, did she say how many countries did she say had, had implemented a carbon price? Because it's. Yeah, I mean it's it's very very low, and also you've got to bear in mind a lot of these are re this, a lot of these are really low, right? That like they're nowhere nowhere uh, near where they need to be, and she'll say that's because we don't listen to economists. But my contention is essentially that our, our capitalist economies, the way they are, are structured fundamentally in a way that makes it very difficult just to tax carbon and expect to see good results you need more fundamental changes you need to give people an alternative to driving to work they need good public transport pedestrianized cities cycle lanes etc you know what i mean and and yeah so it's not just not listening to economists and carbon taxes and trading schemes only apply to about a quarter of all emissions and the price of carbon is almost certainly still too low but it's a step in the right direction in summary but what why okay so another <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not letting her speak another issue i kind of have here is like she's like oh we didn't listen to economists but why does she think that that carbon taxes haven't been implemented right because there's a problem here with capitalism that goes beyond negative externalities that goes beyond even carbon lock-in which is the the lobbying power of capitalists right she, I, I thought she was going to talk about that, but she just said, "Oh, we don't listen to, we don't listen to uh, economists." But it's like, no, company, powerful companies, oil companies, they don't want to be fucking taxed, and they're able to lobby for those changes. It's a very simple outcome of some people having more capital, which, by the way, you still haven't defined satisfactorily. You just talked about financial capital and how you know. Uh, 
poultry person lends financial capital to apple person back in some imaginary prehistoric time Three. Capitalism has been incredibly successful in advancing society. To the extent that it has caused us problems, it's because we haven't properly used it. The solution is not to abandon it, but to make sure it works to our advantage. There's no simple way to do that, and everyone who claims that the solution is to either discard capitalism or blindly trust it didn't understand the problem in the first place. Microeconomics and financial modeling is completely fascinating. It's basically the mathematics that rules the world. If you want to learn more about how it works, our sponsor Brilliant. Right, so. I know this is a sponsor segment, but didn't she just admit that there were problems with microeconomics? It's not the mathematics that rules our world, except in a, except if she's making a point about the power of these models in themselves, right? Because I don't, it, it, it's a lot of it's basically wrong. I mean, the be, the the best you can hope for from this type of economic model is to make some kind of loose, intuitive predictions. It doesn't have anything like the explanatory power of a physics model. You know, the type of she would not. I don't know what the fuck she's doing here. She would not accept the power, predictive power of your average microeconomic model if she were evaluating a physical theory. She wouldn't, she wouldn't even, even if you allow for the fact that the social world is a bit different to the physical world and maybe there's a few more margins for error, she would, still wouldn't allow it. They do not have that much predictive power. Except insofar as they are used by powerful institutions and then they kind of make the world their own. I talked about that in my Uber video, right? And it's been true in financial markets too, but that's, that's another story. Uh, she certainly doesn't talk about that here. So this is just a sponsor, right? Learn Science with Brilliant. So it was actually like only 14 and a half minutes of, of real content. You want to see her debate Ben Burgess? I don't think that'll be necessary. So, just to be clear, to sum up, she hasn't actually really described or defined capitalism properly at all. She described a kind of imaginary thought experiment type history, which is completely wrong. Um, she then didn't really define capital except financial capital with an also incorrect depiction of, uh, of lending. She came up with a definition of capitalism that was capitalism equals free markets plus rules. I, like, I don't even know what that means. It's incoherent. Free markets plus rules. So they're not free markets. When you say markets, capitalism equals markets would be more coherent, but also wrong because you haven't defined capital. Capital results from the ownership, the private ownership of um, mostly means of production, Right from from you know factories to offices to computers, uh, land as well. You can include in that, which is used in order to make a profit. She hasn't spoken about the profit motive. She hasn't spoken about. She she mentioned Marx. She didn't mention M C M Prime. Like arguably the most important observation about capitalism in the history of economics. She didn't mention. She she didn't mention any of this. She hasn't even properly defined capitalism. She had one empirical example, which was penicillin. I'm not even sure it supported her argument. And then, and and then she just like recited a slightly dated economics textbook, with no regard for how they've changed. Right? If you look at like the core economics textbook, um, if you look at like maybe the way the so Angrist and Pishk, for example, would introduce the topic now. It would be about uh, much more about data. It would be less of a focus on these theories, and there would be an acknowledgement that these theories are essentially wrong. So I don't, I don't know. She, it's, just, it's like she just read one book, and or even partially, partially read it because she didn't even get the definition of positive externalities right. I, I, I cannot. I don't understand, like, like, why is capitalism good? Her main point is that it leads to the efficient allocation of resources, but I remind you that she hasn't proved that. She hasn't proved it at all. She barely spent any time on it. She doesn't consider, like, power, you know, issues of basic issues of power. 
she put the the concerns of workers into another story she put the exact type of capitalism we want and how we could change capitalism into another story she put all the interesting discussions about how to cope with climate change into another story yet apparently she's anti greta thunberg without even considering her um her actual proposals a lot of people here confuse capitalism with deregulation I did not anticipate this point to be so widely misunderstood. If I had, I would have stressed it more. I am sorry in case I caused confusion. No, but it's not about deregulation. It's literally what do you think capitalism is? And why is it good? Because, because that's what you haven't told us, actually. You've given a history of like market exchange, which is basically wrong just derived from like thought experiments that you'll find in old economics textbooks. One of the often unstated problems of free markets is that every agent in that free market is trying to make it as unfree as possible for the other agents. Eh, I'll give you that. Two very crucial things you don't really cover. Markets are almost never free. Governments or other entities get involved to skew markets one way or another. <laughs> Monopolies in patents. As company grows in size, the best strategy to make money changes from compete with others to make the best product to get rid of all the competition by any means necessary. This includes buying out the competition using patent law, other laws to prevent competition. Okay, yeah, fair enough, patents. Someone told me to look at... I remember my economics professor saying that most people think that the job of economists is to advise, advise governments, when instead it is more common for governments to hire economists to justify their policies. Yeah, that's kind of true. I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I, I, somebody said that there's a, she has a reply down here that would be quite funny, but I don't know. I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't see it. Maybe it's just disappeared into the ether. So, I think if I were to mount like a qualified defense of capitalism, I would probably center the mcm prime circuit right like the profit motive and i could you could say as marx did that it played a progressive role historically in terms of shattering old social relations which were you know feudal uh, or you know in that sense authoritarian often patriarchal for instance and it also um sort of drove material progress forward in in, in some sense and you know created a rise in the material standard of living which i do think is true but once you get into the details of like the debates today about the environment uh, about workers rights which are the interesting things that she put to one side then you just you just start to realize that capitalism is often in the way in almost in, in almost all of those cases it gets in the way and that's that requires an understanding of what capitalism is, because then you start to talk about what are the ownership rights. You know, look at the housing market. Who owns who owns housing, right? Um, well, the ownership of land, the private ownership of land, in the way that we have during capitalism, created an elite. You know, it used to be the feudal lords, but land was largely inherited back then. Now it's like a land owning elite who um, are able to make money on the market. It's a different set of people there's probably some crossover of course especially in the uk but like that that creates vast inequalities that private ownership of land can we have democratic ownership of of uh, factories and offices absolutely can we have like democratic ownership of the internet of social media platforms yes it used to be kind of democratic de facto and then bill gates kind of took it over and now the other tech companies have taken it over right i don't like the the very limited historical role well not very limited actually that's that's a that's an exaggeration but the limited historical role that capitalism had in sort of affecting industrialization is the way to defend it i think um but that would require you to know what you're talking about all oh, right okay that's it that's it She's a physicist, not an economist. You can't expect her to deal in nuance. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I expect her to give a half-decent definition of capitalism. You know, there's a difference between not providing detail and getting things completely and utterly wrong. 
uh, and not doing your research. I don't, I don't think that's, and, and you know, if you can't do a sufficient amount of research, then why bother? Why bother making the video? I don't make videos about physics. Of course, I do, I don't want to be unfair in the sense that I do think economics is a debate for everyone and it does affect everyone, but like, if someone, she's not someone at the pub, right? She's got a massive platform, much bigger than mine. And she's being fucking, she's just being irresponsible with it. She's, she's not doing her research. She's not defining her terms. She's not representing arguments accurately. And she's putting everything interesting to one side for another story. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I reckon there are plenty of physicists that could, could do better, uh, Custard. Please make a physics video in the style of Sabine's video on capitalism. Yeah, that would be quite funny. <laughs> oh, God. It's such a good good idea. Was capitalism helpful in China? Well, I think so. China's a very complicated... Uh... She made a reply to the pinned comment where she explicitly said she did zero research for the video. Mate, that is... Uh... That is... <laughs> that is terrible. It is, it's really telling, isn't it? Because I do think that it's, it's funny when I, it's funny that you say she, she did zero research because when I asked, when I asked my mum, right, when I was like 12 or something, I asked my mum where money comes from. Um, and she told me the barter story. Now my mum is a social worker. Um, she doesn't make videos for a million people on YouTube and the barter story turned out to be completely wrong, Right. Um, but it's just interesting. Oh, our comments are under the pin comments. Oh God, are we are we going to go back? Are we going to go back? Oh God, we can't go back. Only forwards. Capital. Oh, hello. So it's interesting that she basically just seems to recite the type of story that most people, including my mum, would have in their head about how money emerge so one that we've just absorbed culturally via osmosis that results from like just armchair reasoning and not really understanding the history and obviously like you know um it's just it's just not acceptable if you're making this this type of video and then there's the the reference to marx as well it's like oh by the way marx thought that this was really bad for workers but let's not talk about that that's again that's the type of thing like if i were a, a sort of 15 year old hurriedly putting together an essay on capitalism. I'd probably come up with something like that. Like Marx acknowledged that capitalism was bad for the workers. When actually, I don't think that is... Obviously, Marx had a very strong uh, social conscience and he did think that, you know, workers were uh, suffered under capitalism. That much is clear. But I don't... If you read Marx and Marxism, I think what you get is something very different. You get a much more systemic account of how dynamics under capitalism emerge. So she's just referenced Marx because she knows she has, has to. You are confusing capitalism and markets which are not related in any way. Well, I wouldn't say they're not related in any way, but fine. I think the negative feedback is a little deeper than that, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> mate, mate, jar not real. It's just absolutely seen her off. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez oh man mate I love that guy it emerged on its own oh mate I can't keep track of all this fucking personally I think this is a very important topic that is widely misunderstood especially among people of the younger generations a 16 hour lecture would do nothing to remedy this problem yes but do you think that maybe there's a midpoint between 16 minutes and 16 hours like some people say that periods of time actually exist that are both larger than 16 minutes and uh <laughs> smaller than 16 hours i've heard it i've heard it said i don't know if you guys have heard anything about that like i don't know um one hour for example there's there's one hour. have you ever heard of one hour has anyone ever heard of one hour I don't, is it just me? And how can you rectify the understanding on a topic when you haven't even done your research? 
This is some fucking bullshit. She's just acting like everyone's misunderstood. Like you're trying to make an ideological debate out of what is not one. I am happily admit that I am out of depth when it comes to modern economics, which is why I didn't talk about it. This is really basic stuff. Basic economics has changed since the 2008 financial crisis. Economists realized they couldn't peddle the, the fucking theoretical bullshit anymore that you put out in the video. They're trying to make an ideological debate. How is it not an ideological debate? You started by talking about Greta Thunberg and Robert F. Kennedy. Two massive ideologues, one of whom I obviously prefer to the other. But they are both ideologues, right? And I don't, you know, so you're inserting yourself into that debate between two ideologues, but you're not making an ideological statement? What? And I'm not, like, ideologue isn't all bad. I think, you know, ideology has its function. If I would better uh slovenian voice i'd do an impression of uh zizek all right all right okay there's the you know there's only so much i can fucking just go through every little thing she says and repeat myself um but i think let's call it there because i have lost the will to live um <laughs> thanks for joining everyone we had so many people uh i'm glad you all joined me so i'll um i'll upload this to my live channel by the way so I've got Unlearning Economics live. If you wanna, if you wanna watch this video, it won't be on the main channel because I'm just gonna keep that for scripted videos. And there's a scripted video uh, coming, hopefully on Friday. It's been a while, but we're gonna up the frequency of videos. I'm now self-employed. I'm doing this full time, so I'll do a few more React videos and I'll do like um, more frequent scripted videos. But thanks for joining, everyone.